My name is Liza Bernard, and on behalf of uh, Norman Williams Public Library, we welcome you all to this midday event with Ron Miller. Um, Ron needs little introduction to those of us here in Woodstock. He's an educator, educational scholar and activist, a teacher, a publisher, and a bookseller. Former bookseller. Former. Uh, Not the viewer. Good <laughs> um, community leader and um, philanthropist. He received a PhD from Boston University in American Studies, and he has taught at Goddard College and Champaign College, and he helped establish the Bellwether School in Williston. Come on in, just doing the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, he needs a little introduction. Um, from 2014 to 2021, he ran the learning lab here in Woodstock, where he taught American history, among other topics. And I'm wondering how many people here participated in the learning lab. I do a fan club. Um, he's offered, authored several books and has founded, published, or edited several magazines. And um, he's been involved in the library uh, in the past. He was the president at one point of our board of trustees. And he served, or is currently serving, on several other nonprofit boards, including the Vermont Humanities Council. And we're fortunate to have him back in town for this discussion. So, yeah. thank you, Liza. Thank you. Um, I just want to say it's wonderful to be back and to see old friends um, who I haven't seen in a couple of years now. It's, it's. Um, thank you for coming, and I want to thank the library for making this happen. Um, I. I popped through town about three months ago on my way somewhere else, and Kathy at the, at the desk said, would you do a, a talk for us sometime? Said, well, okay. So that's what led to this, and Liza put it all together, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, I guess I, should pro I just want to say something about my red eye, in case you've noticed that. It's not an injury, it's just a, a popped blood vessel or something. It doesn't hurt, but I know it looks awful. So I I just wanted to get that out of the way. Um, so, all right, let's, let's jump into it. So today is the 237th anniversary of the signing of the Constitution of the United States. Um, that's not the ratification, but that's when the, the guys who drafted it said, this is it, we, this, this is our work, we're done, we put our names on it. Uh, September 17th, 1787. So this document is what holds our country together. Uh, people in high office, people in the military take an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. It's, it's a very important document. And one reason it's so important is that our country, uh, as everyone knows, uh, we are a composite of people from many parts of the world, many different cultures, uh, religious and ethnic backgrounds. There is not an ancient American culture the way many other countries have. When, when, when you're a, a French, a French, I was going to say Frenchman, but that's French person, um, you know, you have a thousand or more years of heritage to attest to that. But, but to be an American means you've taken a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and my ancestors came from there, and uh, there's even been some scholarship on the original colonizers of, of America, and we think, oh, well, they were all English, right? They were all Anglo-Saxon, or whatever term you want to use. And the scholarship is saying, well, no, they weren't even that. They came from different parts of the British Isles with very different uh, uh, cultures and values, and the, the patterns in which they settled here have, con have contributed to uh, regional differences, very strong regional differences in our country. And so, um, and we'll talk a little more about that because those, those are coming to the fore even today, these, uh, these underlying differences within our country. So when the Framers got together in Philadelphia and said, we need a stronger national government to, to tie together this, these 13 colonies and these, these different regions. There, there's a, a slave-holding society here and an anti-slave society here and small states and big states and commercial shipping states and agricultural areas. 
How do we pull this all together in, in one government? And they achieved that in the Constitution by making a series of compromises. They tried to have something for everyone so that all the 13 colonies or states at that point, the 13 states would agree to it. They each had a, a ratifying convention. And in each one, it was not a done deal. The Constitution was not immensely popular at first. There were people, a lot of people, a lot of important people who did not want the, these states to be bound together the way the British Empire had bound them together and, and lorded it over them. So they, there was a lot of resistance to the Constitution. And in a couple of states like New York and Virginia, the ratifying conventions approved it by about three votes. It just barely got by. So we look back at the founders and at, at how they negotiated with each other and with, with each of the states and really accomplished something amazing. And, it, and it, was, it was a Republican form of government. That's a small r Republican, not our current Republican Party. But um, I'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes, what that actually means. But this was a new thing in history. It was a rare thing in history to not have a monarchy uh, or an established aristocracy, but to say the people here are sovereign. This will be ruled by the people. So it's a huge achievement, September 17th, 1787. Having said all that, the focus of my research lately and my talk today is that it might be time to retire the thing that it may have reached the end of its useful life, that it's, it, this 18th century package of compromises is running into a 21st century world that is so different and so challenging um, that, the, that our, our whole system is, is under immense pressure. And this sounds like a, a totally a fringe idea, right? How can you possibly question the, the sacred constitution? Uh, more and more very legitimate scholars are, are starting to, to think like this. And just a couple months ago, this book came out. It's called No Democracy Lasts Forever. And the author is Erwin Ch uh, Chemerinsky, who's the dean of the law school at UC Berkeley. So he's not some fringe character. Uh, but he makes a very persuasive case that the Constitution uh, is in big trouble right now, and in fact, it's it's part of the trouble that these co these compromises that worked 237 years ago are not serving us well right now. So what do we do about that? That's that'll be my next talk, but we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. He, uh, Chair, Chair Marinsky has a few ideas about that, but I just uh, so the purpose of having this talk today is to say, well, wh where are we? in the historical stream. You know, we've had 237 years of, of this document uh, being immensely successful, other than the Civil War. It, it has been immensely successful in holding our country together. We still take an oath to it. It's, it's immensely important. But as we look around at the world and at, at, at things in our own country, is it time to think a little differently about it? And, and really, that's all my only purpose today. I'm, I'm not going to go on a, a big campaign here. Let's, let's get rid of the Constitution. That's not what this is about. It's let's start thinking about it the way Chemerinsky is asking us to, that, hmm, th things are not looking very good. What, what can we do? So um, I'm going to read a couple of quotations from other scholars who are, are thinking along the same lines, just to give you a flavor of, of this way of thinking. So there are two political scientists, uh, Tom Ginsburg and Aziz Huk, H-U-Q is his last name. In 2018, they wrote a book called How to Save a Constitutional Democracy. They were worried that things were, were not looking good. And here's just one sample of, of, the, of what they've said in that book. The US has an exceedingly old and very brief constitution. Being old and lacking an easy amendment mechanism, the US Constitution does not necessarily reflect the learning of subsequent years and decades. It instead calcifies 
the mistaken assumptions and prejudices of a long dead generation. The US constitutional system's 18th century design leaves it vulnerable to the 21st century threat of democratic erosion, which is happening in many parts of the world right now. This isn't just an American problem. Americans would be deeply unwise to rely on the constitutional and legal infrastructure already in place to defend our democracy. So that's their warning from uh, six years ago. A few years before that, an, uh, another constitutional law scholar, I think he teaches at Georgetown, his name is Lewis Michael Seidman. He came out with a book called On Constitutional Disobedience. He's basically saying we can have great respect for the Constitution, but let's not worship it the way we, we have been. We, we might need to start disobeying it. And why is that? So here's, here's a, a passage from this book. He says, when the framers did their work, America was a small pre-industrial society huddled along the eastern seaboard. A large portion of the country's economy depended upon slave labor. Travel was arduous and treacherous. Communication beyond one's immediate environment took weeks or months. The framers knew nothing about nuclear weapons, mass production, multiculturalism, cell phones, professional sports, modern birth control, or global warming. It is impossible to imagine what they would have thought about women's liberation, evolution, gay marriage, psychoanalysis, reality television, globalization, or the war on terror. The sheer oddity of making modern decisions based upon an old and archaic text ought to give constitutionalists pause. They insist that we follow the commands of people who knew nothing of our problems and have nothing to do with us. All right, so the, these kinds of statements, they're, they're, they're shocking, right? They're, they're a little shocking. Uh, but they're basically saying that we live in a different world than the Constitution's framers lived in, and we need to, we need to face that fact. Now, the, the argument against that is the Constitution is brief. Uh, remember, that's uh, 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 Ginsburg and Hook said that it's an old and a brief Constitution. Well, you try to read it. I see you have, you have a little copy of it. It's not really that brief. There's a lot there. But other countries have very, very explicit constitutions. They, they give all the details about what the government should, should do and not do. Ours is brief because it's open to interpretation. It's open to application, which is what our courts uh, constantly are doing. So the argument is, it doesn't matter that it was written so long ago in a different kind of world. We're able to interpret it. It's, it's the principles that matter. And that's why the Constitution has endured. That's a good argument. And let's, let's hold on to that, because maybe, maybe we need to keep going that way. But what I'm going to talk about now is I, I think there are seven different aspects of modernity, of, of the world in the 21st century, that make it difficult, make it problematic to even hold on to the principles in the Constitution. Not that the principles are wrong, but maybe there's a better way to implement them, to institutionalize them. Uh, so I'm, I'll list them first, and then I'll go into each one. So. Uh, I would, I would argue that our culture today has lost the sense of what the framers knew as virtue, Repub Republican virtue, and we'll talk about what that means. Yeah. Secondly, um, the, the, not only the rise, but the complete domination of partisanship, the loyalty and identification with one's party, with one's ideology, over one's loyalty to the country and, and to the community um, is, is a problem. Uh, third is, is just the sheer complexity of the modern world. As, as these quotes indicated, the world today is just so much more complex than what the framers knew. 
A fourth uh, area I want to talk about is the extreme inequality in the, in the world economy today uh, and the fact that the, the working class and even much of the middle class now is feeling alienated, feeling disempowered from, from governance, from what goes on in society. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, a fifth difference in today's world is this global trend of populism, this, uh, it, which is a response to that disempowerment of, of so many people. They want to take power back, right? which is understandable. But it's, it's a different way of thinking about power and, and governance and democracy than what the founders knew. They, they, would, they would, would have been horrified by populism. I don't know what James Madison would even say in, in response to what's happening in the world today. Um, a sixth area is to look at our technology, especially communications, mass media, social media, the internet. It's a whole different way of being in the world than what the founders had in their world. And, and it changes things dramatically. And then lastly, I want to uh, just talk a little about uh, the rise of demagoguery. Um, the founders uh, were absolutely frightened of the fact that demagogues can arise in a democratic society. And they did everything they could to guard against it. Well, maybe what they did isn't enough for, for these times because of all these other factors. All right, so th that's, that's where we're going to go with this. But I'll, I'll pause here if anyone wants to make a comment or an objection or, or has a question. Yes, Gary. So, you know, I think it's all very interesting what you said so far. The idea of doing away with something means that you're going to replace it with something else. That's a later talk, I think. Is that what you said? It could be. I mean, I don't think we should leave here without having any idea. Okay. But, yes, yeah, something new needs to be brought needs forth. And, and I think you're also making a distinction. There's the Constitution and there's democracy. So you're not saying to grow off democracy. You're saying maybe a rethink of the Constitution itself. That's what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm, no. In fact, in fact, these many of these modern forces are pushing democracy aside. And and what I'm saying is the Constitution is proving not to be strong enough to prevent that. So how do we how do we reclaim? Um, Cher, Chemerinsky's main argument is that the compromises that they made, so the, the electoral college, uh, lifetime appointment of judges, um, equal representation in the Senate, no matter how large the state is, think, structural things actually pro inhibit democracy. They work against it. And, and so now that there's more pressure on, dem on democ democratic ideals, the structure isn't there to push back. That, that's what he's saying. Not, not to get rid of democracy, but how do we preserve it in, in these difficult times? There are many scholars, historians, whatever, who, who will say the Constitution itself never intended to set up a democracy. The, the founders thought democracy was mob rule. The founders set up a republic, not a democracy, uh, which is another reason that the critics, these critics today are saying, well, of, of course, that's, that's another reason we need a different constitution or, or a heavily amended constitution. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do you worry that if we do away with the current structure, that that might plant seeds of thinking of these structures as more disposable? So who's to say that a new wave will come along five years later and say, oh, this <coughs> one go? Right. That's, that's a, exactly the discussion that, that these guys, not, not him, but these guys 200 years ago, had and I think I think the most interesting uh, part of that discussion was James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, who were allies and great friends, but they looked at constitutions a little differently. Madison, who was the primary architect of of our constitution, strongly believed you don't you don't change it easily. You don't just toss it because this is the fundamental law of the land. It's got to be respected as, 
as an anchor for, for our, our whole system. And Jefferson came back and said, no, you should, you should have a new constitution in every generation. You, you should not be bound by the prejudices of, of people who are gone. You should, uh, the world, Jefferson said this, the world is constantly changing. We need new, <coughs> new ways of, of, of constructing our government every 30 or so years, every generation. So they had this argument. Uh, Madison basically won it because we're, we still have this constitution. So yes, there, there is the fear that if you treat it too lightly, um, then sure, let's just change it whenever we get a little bit irritated. I think we have to make the case that it's, it's not just a matter of, of, of irritation or minor problems, that there's a real, again, I don't want to put myself in the position of saying, I, I really am pushing, gosh, we better change this now. I'm saying, let's think about this. It may be we've reached a point where the pressure is so great, it's time for a change. 237 years is a long time. It, it, it's, it's had its chance. There's nothing, there's nothing frivolous about waiting 237 years. Ron, uh, when you say populism, how would you define that? I mean, is that neutral or is that um, negative? Um, I'll try to define it neutrally, but you can certainly look at it positively or, or negatively. Um, you know, let me get to that because that, that's going to be one of the one of the main points here. So I'll, I'll I have a whole spiel about that. I'll get into that. Yep, Steve. Oh, Ron, just a thought. I'm not a religious person in that sense, but the Bible, you know, has been around for many thousands of years, and many people believe that. I don't have to necessarily agree with everything in the Bible, but there's a spirit to it. And that's the way I grew up, believing that the Constitution does not necessarily have to be literally taken, but there is a spirit, an intention yeah. uh, of, of the way we'd like things to be. And from that, one, ex one can interpretate, uh, in interpolate, or what is it, uh, you know, can, can assume I can apply this action today, 2024, and say what would the founders have really, what was the spirit? And I think that's the, what we have to really extract, because what we're going to be going back is the basic principles that were probably in the Constitution or the intention of these people years and years and years ago. And we're going to just rewrite it in some way where the same stuff is there, the stuff and essentials. So I'm not sure that rewriting it is going to be it, because one of the true essentials that we need for people to be working together with each other, and the best we can do is the best we can do. Yeah, that's definitely a danger if we were to start fresh, would we lose the spirit of, of, of the original Constitution? And, and, and do we want to do that? It's, there's no guarantees there. All right, well, let, me, let me push on then and uh, give some detail about each of these things, and we can talk more about them. Um, so let's talk about virtue uh, first. Um, so if you go back to 1787, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, the idea of a republican form of government where sovereignty is in the people as a whole and not in a king or, or an aristocracy or some inherited uh, form of power. Uh, the, the people who studied republics historically, even back at that time, and, and James Madison was one of the leading scholars of ancient republics, they all assumed that a nation... That, that, that wanted a republican form of government had to have a virtuous citizenry. If, if sovereignty is in the people, the people need to be able to, to, have, to be responsible for it. Uh, in most places of the world at that time, it was just assumed that human nature is not up to that. We, of course we need royalty and, and uh, Plato and his philosopher kings and, and an aristocracy, uh, right? Because the mass of the people, there's, there's no way they can have the, the rationality and the disinterestedness uh, to, uh, to work together to, to govern themselves. It just won't happen. So the founders had to make the case, yes, we can make this work. And in one of the Federalist papers, Number 55, Madison himself wrote that there are qualities in human nature 
which justify a certain portion of esteem and confidence. Republican government presupposes the existence of these qualities in a higher degree than any other form, any other form of government. So we presuppose that human nature is capable of, of the, the virtues, and he used the word virtue, uh, uh, th that can make this kind of government work. And we'll, in a second, I'll get to what, what exactly what that means. But one more quote here from a historian named Drew McCoy, who, who wrote about Madison. He said, at the Virginia ratifying convention, Madison admitted that if, is, if his countrymen were completely lacking in virtue, as some pessimists claimed, the Republican cause was surely lost. Okay, so what is Republican virtue? Uh, another historian named Gordon Wood, who has studied this topic very, very much in depth, uh, said that public virtue is, quote, the sacrifice of private desires and interests for the public interest. Republicanism puts an enormous burden on individuals. They're expected to suppress their private wants and interests and inculcate disinterestedness. Precisely because republics required civic virtue and disinterestedness among their citizens, they are very fragile polity, polities, extremely liable to corruption. Republics demand far more morally from their citizens than monarchies do of their subjects. So if you look at Madison and Hamilton and John Jay, George Washington, any of the guys, they were all guys, all white, right, all, all men of property, that's a whole topic in itself, that's for another day, but um, you, you look at any of them, they would have believed this about virtue, that you must put your, your grubby self-interest aside long enough to work for the common good, for, for the public interest. And that's the only way this, this constitution or this government is going to work, is if people can do that. That's one reason, it's a main reason, why they were nervous about, going back to your question, Gary, why they were nervous about democracy. Because it's gentlemen like them. Now, they, they weren't exactly an aristocracy. They, they hadn't all inherited positions in life. But they were more highly educated. They owned more property. They had standing in society. And they had, there was this gentleman's code, which was all about virtue and honor and public interest. So, so they said, well, the mass of the people don't really have that. We have to be careful about how much power the, the mass of people have. So the loss of that kind of society that they lived in and the popularization of democracy um, it puts this whole thing into question. Can a, can a popular democracy have enough public spiritedness or disinterest to work? A um, couple more quotes here. So uh, uh, Akhil Reed Amar is a constitution professor at, at Yale Law School. And he says, quite bluntly, the success of our national constitutional project requires that certain things must always exist and exist in abundance in America. Virtue, honor, and conscience rank high among these essential elements. So he's, this is a, a modern lawyer, legal scholar, reinforcing what the, what the founders believed 200 years ago. And then Jeffrey Rosen, who is the president of the National Constitution Center uh, and a law professor at George Washington University, uh, wrote an article in The Atlantic a few years ago. And he, he asked, what would Madison make of American democracy today, an era in which Jacksonian populism looks restrained by comparison? Madison's worst fears of mob rule have been realized. The cooling mechanisms he designed to slow down the formation of impetuous majorities have broken. So another uh, 
another kind of pessimistic take right, on where our country has gone since the time of the founders. If you ask today, do we have virtue and honor and disinterestedness, I think we would all agree that that's just not the culture we live in anymore. Right? We live in a culture of individualism, consumerism, self-interest, self-gratification. Right? All, all the advertising pushes it. I mean, everything in our culture is pushing that. There's very little that's encouraging us to, hey, put, put aside your, your immediate desires. Let's look at the common good and let's work together on things that are larger than ourselves. We don't get that message very much in this culture. And that's a problem. That's, that's a problem for Republican government as, as the founders understood it. Um, do I have, uh, yeah, I'm, I'll, we'll pause after each of these seven things because so, I'm sure it stirs up a lot of, uh, a lot of thoughts. Oh, yes. Um, just talking about like the individualism, I think um, a lot of like people that we've heard speak talk about how we as people are meant to be tribal. Like even going as far back as the caveman, like we were meant to be in tribes, take care of each other, work towards a common goal, care for one another. Someone gets sick or dies, you help take care of them. And I just feel like we as a country have lost that, as you said. Yeah. And that just gets us away from those original ideas. Yeah. Jeffrey Rosen says that, and he's president of the National Constitution Center. That sounds like he might be a Republican. I mean, I, I mean, how, how does he keep his? Uh, he's an independent. I don't know what his personal politics are. Yeah, I don't. Uh, but it must be a very difficult. I mean, he's the executive director, right? Yeah. Um... I mean, he's, he, I think he's encouraging us to, to reclaim that sense of virtue. He wants us to go back to James Madison and say, hey, let's, let's bring this back. So you, yeah, you may get J.D. Vance to speak there. Yeah. Well, I, this is where the debate was mm -hmm. last week, right? It was at the National Constitution yes. Center. Yeah, I, know. I don't know if Jeffrey Rosen had anything to do with that. Anyway, okay. sorry. you always get me off on tangents. <laughs> <laughs> They're always fun, but... <laughs> Okay, uh, yes. Well, just one minute. So you said something about the tribal nature of humans, right? And I think the founders looked back into the ancient Roman and ancient Greeks, and, and what they looked at were these relatively small societies, a city state, yeah. and maybe a democratic republic. And we're trying to apply it now to a huge, uh, a, a, you know, a, you know, almost an entire continent. With 330 million people? No. God, I'm sorry. It's just it, it, it's hardly tribal, you know. So some of the insights that they that they use to, to build the constitution, form the constitution, really are way off from what they were using as models. You, yeah. you even alluded to it at the very beginning. Like, even travel in the original yeah. 13 was very difficult. Yeah, their lives are very local. Yes. The reason I paused there, I just remember Liza had asked me to repeat everybody's questions yeah. for the for the microphone here, and I've been totally forgetting to do oh, that. Oh, microphone on now? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah, this isn't a pacemaker. <laughs> uh, I think this primal aspect, which was, was already brought up as a point, is something also that's yeah. a heavy part of, of what we need to consider. Well, the modern world is, is just too, too large to, to be tribal on, on any, kind of, any kind of reasonable scale. I, I don't think I can repeat every single thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm picking up the, the okay. conversation just fine. Okay, good. I think, I think the founders, though, had a different uh, notion of the, nature, the actual nature of man. And they were, uh, it was almost like a, it's this thing on the hill, you know, this bright, uh, the, the native human, you know, that they were full of virtue and all the good things. And uh, that's where, you know, as they say, the rubber meets the road, you know, that, uh -huh. that that wasn't the case. You think they had a more positive image of human nature? Yes. Yeah. I, think, I think they were pretty realistic about it. They, they were hopeful, though. They, they, this took place during the Enlightenment. Right, the period of, of European and, and North American history where a 
there was great optimism, faith in progress, uh, the use of reason would, would, would bring us forward. And, and all of these founders were, were part of that. They, they, so there was this op more optimism about human nature in that, in that period. Yeah, but let's see, Steve and then... Yeah, I'm going to suggest this issue of tribe. We are a tribe in Woodstock. Yeah. We are within the tribe of uh, Vermont. Vermont is within the tribe of a number of states called the United States. We can't get away from tribe. We have to be able to give up our individualism for greater freedoms. There's no freedom that we have that we haven't given up a freedom for. For basically the good of the, uh, the, good of the, uh, the, good of the, uh, of the tribe. And so I think if we realize that, um, I, I think that we just have to, we're fat cats in the United States at this point in time. We have more than we need, and we've forgotten that all of these things are benefits, uh, the generosity of the tribe, so to speak, and how much are we willing to give up for our yeah. freedoms. Yeah. Um, all right, should I go on? <laughs> yeah, go on. I mean, I, right? I, I don't just, expect a reply. Yeah. To me, it's, you know, Okay. <laughs> maybe I'll just make a tiny comment still. Uh, maybe in the mid nineties I had a lecture by Stephen Covey, and there's some, some I, I liked his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. He talked about character and the loss of character. And I think it's a little bit the same thing now. Character, yeah. Yeah. You know, he made his whole presentation was about how we've lost this important characteristic where we think of others. And we give up something of our own, you know, personal gain for the gain of the community. It was a fascinating yeah. lecture. Yeah. Go ahead. But of course, like if you look at it the other way around, like, like I don't know, like it's nice to pretend that they were really interested in virtuous thinking of the good of others, but like these were like slaveholders. So it's just it's not that impressive to me. Like I don't think even if this was their ideal, they weren't really. Yeah. Knowing what they were hoping humanity would achieve themselves, so was it doomed to begin with? I don't know. I just it's hard but, to reconcile that. I didn't yeah. live that life, you mean? Right. Yeah. So it's sort of like we weren't great back then. We're, we're not great in a different way now. You know, was it ever realistic to like and expect this of humans? Yeah. yeah. That's a great point. But if I run on that same point, I think so. Their your view of who would vote. You did a lecture on that once, and who gets to vote, and not a lot. But there's a limited part of the population. Women couldn't vote. Yeah. You got to be a land owner. Yeah. And yeah. Black people couldn't vote. So they had these great ideals, perhaps, and didn't walk the walk. There are definite gaps between. Mm -hmm. Well, remember who they were. Our, our leader just told us who they were. Leader? And they're. And they're and, 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 and they're still here. Aren't they, though? Yeah. All right. Let me go on, because we have limited time. Uh, so the second uh, topic, second factor in, in the, the challenges facing the Constitution are a partisanship, or party spirit. So um, we'll quote George Washington on this. In, in his farewell address as he was leaving the presidency, uh, he said, let me warn you in the most solemn manner against the baneful effects of the spirit of party. This spirit, unfortunately, is inseparable from our nature, um, having its root in the strongest passions of the human mind. It exists under different shapes in all governments, more or less stifled, controlled, or repressed, but in those of the popular form, in other words, in democratic or republican governments, it is seen in its greatest rankness and is truly their worst enemy. Now, Washington, so these words were probably written by Alexander Hamilton, uh, who uh, was a protege of Washington and, and wrote a lot of his, his papers. Um, but Hamilton, was engaged in a bitter partisan dispute with Thomas Jefferson throughout Washington's presidency, well, until Jefferson stepped down, uh, but for years. And, and so uh, you can hear Hamilton saying here, um, I wish that guy Jefferson and his followers weren't, weren't always criticizing me so much. Washington was desperately trying to get his 
Secretary of the Treasury and Secretary of State to get along and to stop sniping at each other. And so he was very glad to say Hamilton's words here, that the spirit of party does not get us anywhere. I, I hate this stuff. You should all just be unified under my leadership. It's basically what Washington is saying. Uh, but it, it's, it was, a again, it comes back to reality and ideals, right? So they, they all believed that the spirit of party was a terrible thing and we should avoid it while they practiced uh, this kind of bitter sniping among themselves. Um, but at least they, at least they said, we, we, ideally, we really want to get away from the party spirit and political parties. We want there to be a common interest, and you've, you've got to put these disputes aside as much as possible. They, they may not have lived up to that, but they believed that. What we have in the 21st century instead is polarization, complete polarization. So it's not only are, are the parties in opposition to each other, but they're completely opposed to each other. They've demonized each other. And I'm not going to take sides here. I think it's, it's the system as a whole. Both sides uh, have put their party interests bef before the national interests. But, but Ron, they were just time. fresh from the monarchy. They were fresh for the monarchy. Yeah. Well, we, we don't even know what a monarchy is anymore until we see certain people speak. Yeah. Right? So, well, you're saying the monarchy helped keep, keep maybe keep a, a national focus? I'm saying that their philosophy is that everything has to do with the monarchy. I yeah. Think. They're still fighting. I mean, no. I don't know. I don't know. I love. I mean, I mean, George Washington, as much as he rejected the idea that he was going to be a monarch, he he filled that role for people. He was this father figure, and when he patted them on the heads and said, "You guys, you boys, have to stop fighting," it meant something. And we don't have that now. Maybe that's what you're saying. We don't have anything like a monarchy to keep us corralled. Or, or he's trying to say it was the threat of going back to a monarchy that enabled this spirit. Uh-huh. Hmm. Could be. Um, what I hope to show today, though, is that partisanship in itself is you know, regrettable, but it, it, what makes it worse is how it fuels so many of these other uh, factors. So they, they all work together, and I, I'm going to, those of you who know me know that I'm, I'm a holistic thinker, right? And so the combination, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So partisanship and, and the, the polarization that we have today is not just bad in itself, it also makes all of these other things that much worse. And, and you'll see how that plays out. So let me talk about the next one, which is complexity the complexity of the modern world. So uh, Seidman's list of all the things that we live with and, and take for granted that the founders had no idea about, just wasn't in their world. And even in, in his list, he had the, the theory of evolution, right? J Charles Darwin. Darwin was 80 years after, after the Constitution. So ba basic principles that we take for granted, they, they couldn't have conceived of, of many of them. So our world is much, much more complex. What does that matter? Why does that matter? So I'm going to quote uh, uh, an economist named Friedrich Hayek, uh, who is uh, a well-respected well conservative economist and political thinker. Um, at one point, he wrote this. He said, the more civilized we become, the more relatively ignorant must each individual be of the facts on which the working of civilization depends. Right, so we, we have our own little spheres that we work in. Maybe we're very good at what we do, but no one of us has an understanding of how all these systems in the world work. The, the banking system, the uh, medicals, I mean, just make a list of all, all the, th plumbing. <laughs> I mean, all the things that we, 
that we need in our, in our lives. We can't operate them. We need specialists. And politically, that matters because we no, we no longer have people with a large view of things. So if we want people to be disinterested and public spirited, well, how can you be if you don't understand how everything works? And the system itself becomes more remote from our control. So here, um, uh, Ginsburg and Hooke, again, the, the political scientists, point out that economic globalization, global environmental problems, increasingly sophisticated technology, mass migration, um, economic stagnation and inequality, the internet, social media, any one of these areas requires social and political management that is correspondingly sophisticated and complex. Um, I mean, think about uh, the climate climate change, right? How are we going to reduce carbon? Well, each one of us maybe can stop driving, stop flying, or whatever. But if you're talking about the whole system, how do you change a whole energy system? Well, your sustainable Woodstock will do it, right? It's, but it's, 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 it's so big and so complex and so interlocked that you need United Nations agencies, you need treaties, you need global conferences to, to even look at the at, at the scope of these things. And so, and so Ginsburg and Hook conclude that the complexity of modern governance requires autonomous bureaucratic capacity insulated from political control at the day-to-day -day level. Another shorthand term for this is the deep state. <laughs> right? So bu bureaucratic, um, untouchable agencies and organizations that have the expertise to man and the resources to manage these complex systems, you as a voter or even your community, you have nothing to do with that. You have nothing to say about that. And, and you really can't because these are the people who have their hands on the, on the levers. I mean, not that they can control everything either. Things are out of control. But that's the level at which we're working. So power is increasingly concentrated in bureaucracies and non-democratic agencies, central banks, the Federal Reserve, right? We don't, we don't decide anything about the money supply or interest rates. That's, that's what is it, seven people on the Federal Reserve, whatever the number is, right? You've got nine Supreme Court justices. You've got the Securities and Exchange Commission, right? You've got small handfuls of bureaucrats or other unelected people making these huge decisions. Uh, so Ron, would we include lobbyists in that? Public? That was my very next, the very next word like the in my notes. Yes, lobbyists. <laughs> lobbyists and powerful special interests have a disproportionate influence on policy because they're, they're, they're on it all the time, right? The lobbyists for the I don't know, pick one at random. The American Rubber Institute, if there is such a thing. They know all about rubber production and the economics of it, right? And they're, they're in Washington talking to the policymakers all the time. And as, as you said, sometimes they even write the laws themselves, right? So we don't control the lobbyists. So there's another uh, political scientist who, whose work I really like. His name is Yasha Monk, M-O-U-N-K. He's originally German, but he's... He's in the US now, I think he's at Harvard. He wrote a, an excellent book on populism, which I, I know you, you asked a long time ago, but we'll, we'll get to what populism is. He says, politicians seem less and less able to govern an increasingly complex world. We live in an era, an era of radical uncertainty. The people's ability to influence politics has been drastically curtailed. For example, judicial review the Supreme Court deciding what, what's constitutional and what's not, takes many issues on which ordinary people have strong opinions, it takes them out of political contestation. Right? The Supreme Court has decided you can go talk to your representative or your governor or whoever until you're blue in the face, but the Supreme Court has decided and that's the end of it for now. Complexity, therefore, is disempowering and it's anti-democratic. 
So it's totally understandable that around the world today, not just in the US, populism is on the rise. People feel disempowered by these, well, by the deep state, right? These non-democratic agencies and bureaucracies that are making the decisions. And they, they push back against that by wanting to take that power back. And it's all because the world is so complex. Well, it's not all because of that. It's the way the power structure has responded to that. But it starts with the complexity of things. OK, quick, uh, yes. Well, the one unifying thing that makes you feel that there is hope is that there are existential crises if you believe in global warming. That we can no longer say, it's your problem, it's your problem, it's your problem, but we have to get together. Because otherwise, the individual tribes will never get together with one as one tribe to save the world. Yeah. And I think that's one of the ways we can look at this. We're always looking for it. What do we get out of this uh, individually versus can we get greater freedoms like clean air and safety for our children and whatever by giving up something? And at this point in time, countries and individuals are not willing to give up something for the greater good, except now we have that existential crisis, global warming. Thank goodness for global warming. <laughs> it makes me think of, of Ben Franklin's famous comment during the revolution. If we don't hang together, we'll all hang separately. <laughs> um, any other comments before I go on? OK, I have nothing simple well, to say I, about I, complexity. I, <laughs> just, I will say, it's interesting. I don't know just how relevant this is, but something you were saying made me think about how um, the people who are we have elected democratically aren't governing the way they should. And a part of that, I think, seems increasingly they're on the phone or writing letters trying to raise money. So the fact that the influence of money on politics, certainly in the last 30 years, has you know taken our democratically elected officials away from their, their official duties and their fundraising all the time. So I, it seems to me that if money were taken out of the equation, they'd have a lot more time. You know, they they pare down their schedule. They don't. They hardly need any more. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the two houses, and it's like, well, if you take that away, then they they have a lot more time to actually, you know, pay attention to the the issues and learn more about um, things and maybe get the lobby settled more. I don't know. That's they they advocated their responsibilities by just. Wallowing in the money. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's part of the picture for sure. I mean, I'm sure just like the modern developments in technology and in social media, things like that, have made it impossible for them to do their job. I mean, it's made it almost impossible to be a human sometimes, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, they have to work against that every day or try to work with it and make it a part of the greater good. But it's there's so much evil in it that it's hard to. Yeah, I'm going to get to that. that. That's a big one. I'm going to get to that. Yeah. But I, I just. Uh, no, go ahead. No, I'll finish what you were saying. It's fine. Well, I was just going to say the thing that jumps out the most at me about the Constitution um, irrelevance or thing that needs to be addressed. It's the whole gun thing, and I don't want to take us down that lane, but the difference between the kind of gun that they had at the time all this was written and AR-15s and stuff, you know, I don't see how the Second Amendment applies to AR-15s and things. But I don't want to get into a whole gun discussion, but I just wanted to mention yeah, that. So. I think that is an example <clears throat> of how the world is different from the their complexity world. complexity and all. But and it's, beyond that, it's an example of, I don't want to give up anything either. I have a right to yeah. have an AR-15. Yeah. I don't care about your safety or anyone else's. I want my AR-15. I'm not willing to give up anything. That's a partisan aspect. Of it. Yeah. That's why the 19th Amendment had such a hard time passing. That's why what? The 19th Amendment. Oh. Wasn't that? The women's women's yeah. vote. Who wanted, men, to up, who wanted to give it to women? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Good God. Old prejudices. Die hard. Yeah. I, I just one thing popped. It, yeah, it's one thing popped into my head that's um, not a response to anything here, but um, I'm thinking how the, the Supreme Court in recent years um, has been um, has been throwing out a, a many 
administrative, how do, what's the right term for it? Where, where rules are made by agencies, whether it's the Environmental Protection Agency or whatever, um, the, the court is saying, no, Congress has to authorize this. And, and so some, again, I'm not gonna take sides. Some people say, well, you're gutting all these important regulations, right? But, but you can understand it as they're saying, we're trying to take back some of that democratic responsibility. The, the, the elected officials, if they weren't so busy raising money, right? the elected officials should be making the rules, not these unelected bureaucracies. So, so there is a struggle over this. And you can come down on that, whichever side you know feels right to you. But it's it's a struggle. But go well, ahead. I was going to say exactly the same thing um, about the deep state, as you call it. And um, but it doesn't make sense for congressmen and women and senators to be making legislation about something that they couldn't possibly understand unless that was their full time job. So. Right. I feel as though whatever this deep state is, it isn't the EPA, unless there becomes corruption in the EPA. But the the need for people who understand the larger yeah. picture, I mean, otherwise, look at what the senators and Congress people would do if let, if they had more power. <laughs> I mean, my God, I could I would rather trust a bureaucrat, I guess, in that. Okay. Yeah. Well, just kind of riffing off of what Anne was saying, in this increasingly complex world, I trust experts, and I believe in expertise, whether they're scientists or doctors. But I think one of the fundamental challenges we have right now as a society is a lack of humility around what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of fear around that. And I think that's part of the problem with distrust. Like we don't trust scientists. Yeah. We don't always trust doctors, even though they're the experts. So I think there's, a, a, in some ways, a lack of humility around what we don't know and loss of faith and expertise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So complicated stuff. Let me, let me go on, because I'm looking at the time. Um, I, I want to get through these seven points, and we'll hopefully have more time to talk. The next, the next point, then, is um, inequality in a global economy and what this has done to uh, the middle class and working class uh, and, and their sense of themselves as part of the community. So Madison in particular, uh, among the founders, had uh, emphasized this Republican theory that the widespread ownership of property was essential for, for a Republican society. Right? So we like to criticize the founders and say, well, they only wanted property owners to be able to vote. The flip side of that is they wanted everybody to be property owners. They didn't want there to be an underclass that was permanently excluded. So their vision was a spreading of, and maybe not all of them, uh, Madison and Jefferson were on the, if you want to call it, the left side of, of that generation. Madison, not quite so much. But they, they wanted to, to spread the wealth to some extent. Jefferson pushed through the Louisiana Purchase, for example because he wanted all of this land for people to be able to have a fresh start and to own land. He said that's the basis of a, of, of a government of the people, is when the people all have a stake in, in, in the world, in, in, their, in their society. Incidentally, this is also where Abraham Lincoln was coming from. And the, the rise of the Republican Party in the 1850s was all about, they called it free soil. Free soil, free labor, free men. If everyone has access to land, to property, we won't have a permanent underclass. You might start out poor, but you will, you will rise. That was the ideal. However, that's not the way things worked out, right? Toward the middle and end of the 19th century, industrialization completely changed how work was done, right? Think of the factories. Think of what... Think of what happened in England in industrialization. Um, massive immigration, uh, mostly very poor people who were willing to take these factory jobs, completely changed the, 
um, the politics in his country. And then the closing of the frontier, right? At the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, the historian Frederick Jackson Turner said, the frontier is closed, which means we've settled everywhere there is to settle. There's no virgin land left. I mean, there obviously were pockets everywhere, but basically we're done. So this ideal of just keeping just spreading out and poor people can start fresh over there and over there just wasn't going to happen anymore. So at this point in American history, you start to see socialism and anarchism and, and labor movements on the rise. And the founders never had to deal with anything like that. All right, so this is a, a working class that's realizing that they're, they're being pushed out, they're being pushed down, there's no opportunity left. They're gonna organize and try to and contend for power. The US was able to keep the lid on that through the progressive movement. When reforms were made, there were some constitutional amendments that opened things up a bit. The income tax, for example. Okay, yeah, we'll tax rich people. And um, so they, they let the steam out just enough that there wasn't a rebellion in 1910, let's say. Um, then the depression came though, and the same cycle happened all over again. You had a lot of working people, disenchant disenchanted people were turning to fascism and communism. Ooh, the Soviet Union, they're doing some good stuff over there. Everybody's equal, right? And it was Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal brought them back into the fold, said, no, no, we, we will make things more fair. We will include the working class, the labor legislation of the New Deal, right? So going into the 50s, after, after World War II, going into the 50s, there was this sense of, hey, we are in this together, and, and labor unions are respected, and, and uh, we're working together for the common good. We sometimes call this the, the New Deal coalition. Well, that started falling apart, right, uh, for many reasons. We can talk about the culture war of the 60s, but primarily I want to focus on the deindustrialization of America in the started picking up speed in the 70s and 80s, right? All these masses of jobs just disappeared. Uh, northern industrial cities became the rust belt. Small towns across the country just emptied out, right? So this was the beginning of a process that is still, still bothering us today, still going on, the hollowing out of the heartland. Uh, and it's very complicated, like everything else, right? It's globalization, it's, it's um, automation, computers and robots, and it's just lots of things happening at once. But the upshot of it is that working people increasingly feel they don't have a stake in the society. They don't have a voice. They don't have opportunity. Um, I'm not going to go for deeply into this. I mean, you, you know what I'm talking about. We could talk about deaths of despair and opioids and a whole bunch of stuff. But um, the important point is that you, you have an alienated group of people which the founders realized if we ever have a, an alienated class in America, we're in trouble. Our Republican form of government is not going to work if there isn't widespread ownership, widespread buy-in. So again, you look at pop, I still haven't defined populism, sorry, but you look at the populist movement, you look at um, people who are so enthusiastic about, uh, about Trump and the Republican Party, this is this is where they're coming from. They say, we've been pushed aside. We've been left out. And we're just not going to stand for that anymore. Uh, let me skip through a little bit of this. Let me go back to Yasha Munk. Uh, he has, uh, describes, this, describes this very well. When people lose high-paying, unionized jobs, they do not just lose their footing in the middle class. Rather, they also stand to lose a whole set of social connections that structure their lives and give them meaning. As an earned identity slips out of their reach, right? And a person who's working, 
working hard for a living and making it and has a community. Uh, it's an earned identity. I've earned this I, with my own hands. Right? That's something to be proud of. But as that slips out of their reach, says Munk, they are likely to default to an ascriptive identity. That's a fancy sociological term. It means you, you didn't earn it, you just uh, inherited it. It's ascribed to you. Making, which makes their ethnicity, their religion, and their nationality more central to their worldview. Elites and upwardly mobile people, in other, in other words, the people who are still in the running for, for the goodies in society, um, who do hold earned identities, Monk says they tend to disparage those who seek meaning through ascriptive ones. For example, those basket of deplorables. Oh, man. All right, and everything that that stands for. I'm not, I'm not, yeah. That's, it's an attitude that is shared by the people who are still upwardly mobile toward the people who have been frustrated. I'm going to quote a British person on, on this. So when Brexit was happening, there was an opponent of Brexit who said, there is a crisis of liberalism because we have not found a way to connect to the lives of people in the small towns of the post-industrial wasteland whose traditional culture has been torn away. So I'm going to abbreviate this a bit because I, I can tell we're, we're getting a little bogged down here and it's been an hour. Um, but I think you, you get the point here that there's if, if the Republican form of government is about all of us together with, a, with common interests and, and working together, the fact of a, of a dis, disillusioned and disrespected chunk of society, maybe, a, maybe half of our society at this point, um, is, is a danger signal. It's, it's just not going to work. OK, now we get to populism. What is populism? All right, let's start with what liberalism is. Liberalism is the rule of, it's not like liberals and conservatives, because conservatives come from liberalism ultimately also. It's the rule of law, respect for individual rights, protection of minorities, civil liberties. The, the, the framers didn't use the term liberalism, but this, this is what they were, were after. It was a, a liberal political culture. We have assumed that liberalism and democracy go together. Liberal democracy, right? Anything else is, doesn't work. Yasha Munk tells us that populism is splitting them apart so that you now have illiberal democracy. So you still want the people to rule. You want the majority to rule. So it's democratic. But you no longer are so careful about the rule of law or protection of minorities or individual rights. If the people, if the people's will wants something, they should they should have it. So you look at historical figures like like Andrew Jackson. That's what he was all about. Right? The the uh, the, the people rule here. And if if we have to push aside some technicalities, well, so be it. Uh, that's populism. It's a rejection of elitist liberalism. So that's, that's, liberal, that's liberalism without democracy. It's, it's the, the flip side. So people with wealth uh, or education or influence, um, and it goes back, uh, what's the word you used about, about experts are, you got a good word? Uh, lack of humility. Lack of humility, yeah. Right, so if they're governing from that position, um, that's the opposite of illiberal democracy. That's, that's liberal anti-democracy. It's right. So populism is pushing back against that. Um, populists are disturbed by a stagnant and uncertain standard of living, a threatened cultural identity, and they're enabled by popular media to give voice and legitimacy um, to, to these outside views, right? It's not just the elites who, who, who can talk on social media. Everybody has a voice now, and that fuels populism. Okay, two more. I, I, I can read the audience here. You're all getting a little, because 
usually we would take a break after an hour. Okay. All right, maybe I'm projecting. Okay. All right, good. No, we're just feeling depression. Oh, depression. Well, good. That's, that's a good thing. Okay. All right, so the six, I think we're up to number six. Um, communications media, I think, is a huge, huge disruptive force right now. We can, we can go around and around circles saying how, how it empowers people, the revolutions in what the Arab Spring or the Eastern Europe in 1989, it all happened because of technology, people could communicate with each other, that's great, and it's tremendously disruptive in, in many other ways. So we'll go back to Jeffrey Rosen from the uh, National Constitution Center. Uh, in that Atlantic article, 2018, he says, newspapers of the time, the late 18th century, while often highly partisan, were also platforms for elites to make thoughtful arguments at length. That's an important phrase there, thoughtful arguments at length. Madison believed that the enlightened journalists, who he called the literati, would ultimately promote the commerce of ideas. He had faith that citizens would take the time to read complicated arguments, which is why Madison and Hamilton and Jay wrote the Federalist Papers. Those were newspaper articles. They were opinion pieces meant to be read by the voters um, to support the Constitution. He had faith they would take time to read complicated arguments, allowing level-headed reason to spread slowly across the new republic. This is enlightenment thinking, right? Then, then Rosen says, uh, at, at, in 2018, it was still called Twitter, Facebook, and other platforms have accelerated public discourse to warp speed creating virtual versions of the mob. Inflammatory posts based on passion travel farther and faster than arguments based on reason. Rather than encouraging deliberation, mass media undermine it by creating bubbles and echo chambers in which citizens see only those opinions they may already embrace. Um, he goes on, media polarization has allowed geographically dispersed citizens to isolate themselves into virtual factions, communicating only with like-minded individuals and reinforcing shared beliefs. Far from being a conduit for considered opinion by an educated elite, social media platforms spread misinformation and inflame partisan differences. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, right? We know this. But th this, is, this is significant in, in evaluating how is the Constitution doing in this world. The Constitution can't keep up with this. The Constitution, the Republican form of government that the Constitution represents was, was meant to, to thrive on slow deliberation, on rational conversation, on sharing of ideas back and forth, a commerce of ideas, and we've lost that. It's, it's awfully old-fashioned. Yeah, well, sometimes old things are good. Um, okay, that, I, that's all I'll say on that. I mean, that's pretty, pretty self-evident, I think. And then lastly, and then we'll have a little bit of conversation. Um, demagoguery, what is a demagogue? An unscrupulous politician who seeks to win and hold office through emotional appeals to mass prejudices and passions. I mean, if it, it's hand in glove with the new, the new media, right? That's, that facilitates it perfectly. Half-truths and outright lies can be used in, to, to dupe the voters. Political philosophers, going all the way back to the ancient Greeks, were worried that demagogues could make hash out of any democratic government. That as long as the people had the, the right to make decisions, they would be manipulated by charismatic people who could appeal to their emotions. Demagoguery was a, a major fear. And the framers, the founders who wrote the Constitution, 
were very concerned about this. George Washington was explicit in letters that he wrote around the time of the, of the convention. He said, demagoguery is going to be our undoing. Elbridge Gerry, or Nan Bourne likes, likes to call him Gary, Elbridge Gerry, who, whose name is used in the term gerrymandering, because he was the first one to do it. But he was, he was a delegate at the Constitutional Convention. He called demagogues the great pests of our government. And Hamilton, in the very first of the Federalist Papers, wrote, of those men who have overturned the liberties of republics, the greatest number have begun their career by paying an obsequious court to the people, commencing as demagogues and ending as tyrants. Um, one more, one more quote, and then, and then I'm done. Um, James Fenimore Cooper, right, the great novelist, right, um, Last of the Mohicans and all that. So he's, he's a generation later. He's writing in the 1820s, 1830s. This is the time of Andrew Jackson and the rise of popular democracy. So the, the ideal of Republican virtue and calm enlightenment debate is giving way to an early form of populism in the 1830s. And Cooper is very concerned about that. Cooper is an old-fashioned guy, right? And so in, in a collection of essays in 1838, it's called The American Democrat, he says, the peculiar office of a demagogue is to advance his own interests by affecting a deep devotion to the interests of the people. The demagogue always puts the people before the Constitution and the laws. Right? So think back. This is illiberal democracy. Right? So the, the majority of the people are going to get their way whether or not the Constitution and the laws or, or minority rights, those don't matter. It's the will of the people. The demagogue always puts the people before the Constitution and the laws in the face of the obvious truth that the people have placed the Constitution and the laws before themselves. Well, maybe in 1838 you could still say that. So, here we are. <laughs> we've, got, we've got these... Say that last sentence again. The last sentence? Yeah. Uh, what, what we just read and then said maybe yes, the demagogue always puts the people before the Constitution and the laws in face of the obvious truth that the people have placed the Constitution and the laws before themselves. That's when you swear the oath to the Constitution, right? Or um, the Supreme Court hands down a ruling and you say, oh, okay, that's it. That's the law of the land. A, a populist or a demagogue says, no, it doesn't have to be, not if, not if you want something different. I'll, I'll, I'll make that happen for you. All right, uh, last, we've uh, got 10 minutes for comments or questions or toss the bum out or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I wonder in all of this reading that you've done with this new thinking, does anyone talk about uh, the human being's inter interior life and uh, this need, certainly I feel it, I'm, I'm sure everybody in this room does, to know the truth about something. It feels as though the truth, uh, which was set us free apparently, um, is, is, uh, it's, it's gone, it's not even in the conversation. Yeah. So when you say both sides and that we're all doing this I feel as there is a big difference between the people on one side and the people on the other, and that is that the truth has been sacrificed. Uh, they don't believe in the truth. Whoever. I mean, well, no, but I mean, you know whether you're lying. I, yes. Well, you know no. whether it's true uh, that that the Haitians are eating cats and dogs, and it doesn't seem to make any difference. Yeah. So that's the part that just has me, my head reeling. Yeah, that's a big topic. I, I, I don't know where to start on that. <laughs> you have to did, you, did you want to address this? Or you yeah, I, I, I have a thought on it. So, uh, 
Yeah. A good thinker today uh, that I deeply respect is Noah Harari, and he examines how we communicate with one another. He specifically addresses this idea of truth. And I might add a little bit of my own thought here, like your truth may be a little different than my truth. So we both see the same thing, we believe we're looking at it, and we believe that our thoughts about it are accurate, but mine may be a little different than yours. So that, that's one aspect of truth. What Harari talks about, though, is that truth is so expensive. If you want to know about what's going on in Springfield, Ohio, and, and really understand it, maybe you should go there. And maybe you should walk around Springfield, Ohio, and talk to a lot of people. Now, no, we would never do that, but journalists might do that. Or are we just taking some simple thought that, you know, Trump says in a debate, and some people run with it, and some people are totally opposed to it. So Harari would say that truth is very, very expensive. We have to do research. We have to fact check. We have to think about it. You have to maybe go there. You have to get a lot of input. On the other hand, a falsehood or a story or a fiction is easy. I'll just make up a story. I don't have to fact check anything. So we're having a time, a hard time as a society understanding what is truth, what's yeah. real, what's not yeah. real. And it, it's a bit of a problem for sure. Yeah. I think I'd also say, just very briefly, if you look at these, these other factors of, of, of social media and uh, the complexity of the world, um, that makes truth hard. Mm. Right? The truth, truth gets more and more expensive the more complex the world is. Correct. And Harari goes into that as well, right. too. And also, the, the truth may not be agreeable. Yeah. And people yeah. will avoid this thing that's less agreeable in favor of something that is more agreeable. And maybe this more agreeable thing is, that, hey, I want to believe that the Haitians in Springfield are eating dogs and cats. That makes me feel good. What, um, and one more piece um, among these seven things. If you think about this alienated, I don't even want to call it working class anymore, but half the country is alienated, right? They're, they're starting from a different framework as the other half. The world is against them. The world disrespects them. So um, they've, they've got this frame where something is said and, and they're filtering it through that understanding, whereas other people are filtering it to a different understanding. That, that plays a role in this too. But it sounds as though every that we are made up of what's hitting us and how we filter it rather than that there's anything inside us that could reverse that. Well, there is, but it's, it's expensive. <laughs> it's, a, it's a struggle. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Um, uh, two, two things. Uh, Gary reminded me, it's an inconvenient truth about what's happening today for certain populations. Yeah. Uh, as as uh, Gore would have wrote in his uh, brilliant book. The other thing is that Steve, when you heard enough... I couldn't hear what you just said. I just said it's an inconvenient truth. Oh, yeah. In other words, you know, I, I hear it, but it's not what I really want to hear, so I reject that. And that's what I think a lot of people are doing at this point in time. It's just not part of what I want to see, because this country is so filthy rich, I can just do something else. It's inconvenient, you know? The other thing is that when I hurt enough, when I hurt enough, I go back into how do I protect myself, and I forget about what I'm actually getting out of this country and out of this world. And I think what we have to remember is we can always go to anarchy and chaos, but ultimately the bottom line is we're going to have to go together with tribes, as this young lady from Kentucky, the great state of Kentucky, has mentioned. Um, and, and we have to remember that. There are people coming into these, I, I, I always wondered about this. We, if for Americans to remember what this country is all about, we've forgotten about it. What we have to do is go to the immigration swearing societies for new people coming into this country and debrief them. Why are you here? Then we will understand what this country is all about. Mm -hmm. And I think that the Constitution is not naive. There are principles here that are being distorted now to figure out problems that, that inherently in the Constitution is the spirit of how we can get along as people. I would not get rid of the Constitution. I would go over it word for word and say, what was the intention and how do we bring it back to that point? To go back to what the real truth is and what they, they felt. Sorry to go on, but... Okay. Yeah. Um, does anyone have an idea what the new Constitution should look like and who might... 
prepare it? Well, that in itself is how to get he, he's got some proposals. Yeah. But, um, we'll make sure the library gets a copy of this book. Yeah. <laughs> I guess uh, my question, I feel like it's the most important question of them all is, is can our country survive the growing pains that are associated with adopting some, some kind of new system? We wouldn't can be it America survive? anymore. Can it survive I feel like what? if we totally... The, the growing pains of, of adapting this new these new ideas. Oh. Because it seems... To me, that the whole structure is so fragile that to pull the rug out from underneath of it to start new, yeah, just doesn't uh, doesn't sit well with me. I guess one could say. No, it would be very risky. Yeah. I mean, what one of the things he offers, he said, okay, maybe we don't want to start totally fresh, but maybe because we've got all these regional conflicts and factions, maybe we go back to the Articles of Confederation, right, where the states had a lot more of their own authority. And we, we keep the United States as a military alliance, like, like an EU, almost, European Union, right, but the states now become uh, much more autonomous. You can have abortion in one state and not in another, and that's, people can live where they want. Is it all let, let, view? Well, it's a traditional states' rights view, but he's saying maybe that's all we can do at this point is devolve de power because it's just too, it's too big, it's too complex. And so we don't necessarily have to throw everything out, we just maybe, maybe take a step back even from, wh from where the Constitution was. Well, I guess that goes back into our conversation about uh, tribalism. Is, and I guess the, I'm from the smallest county in Kentucky. I graduated high school with 25 people. Okay, so tribalism to me goes even smaller than your school systems and your local levels of right. counties and it, it, to me it goes back to the nuclear family right huh. and without proper structure within the nuclear family we can't ask a productive members of society on the next row i don't know i know uh jordan peterson says that uh, we should put our own house in order before we criticize the world mm. But that gets back to like the nature of people and virtue. And I feel like that starts in the household. I think the nature of people change. Yeah. So our government has changed. We can't control it. They can't control there's too many people. There's too many people to be tribal. Yeah. Yeah. So what do we how, what do we replace it with? Yeah. Like but, but a point that's been made by Steve here, the spirit of it. So yeah. you know, it, I could can compress my tribe, mm -hmm. but if I have the spirit that okay, I might expand beyond my tribe and, and help others and think about the, the, how we can work together and make things better. Yeah, there is a commonality that we're forgetting here. That if we go into individualism, we're going to we're going to lose all of the freedoms mm -hmm. that we take for granted at this point in time. My God, do we have so many freedoms compared to the rest of the world? Something is working here. We're going through all kinds of things, but I think these things can be worked on. Is there? Anyone who hasn't spoken yet who would like a chance before we, before we break? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, I think with tribalness, um, you know, being from Vermont, a uh, student here, there is quite a bit of tribalness amongst the state about who comes here in the fall. Uh, I personally think it's a great part of the economy. They help to support it and keep Vermont continuous. Um, but that's, you know, 600,000 people all who can put themselves into one tribe. Um, I think that can be expanded over to the parties. Um, as we get more and more partisan, people will often find themselves more tribal to their party. Um, and I think with tribalists, it's not necessarily that you need to belong to that tribe and stay there the whole time, but that tribe can be a part of your identity. And I think with the partisanship, people, as they start to move apart in parties, um, it becomes larger and larger and larger, which pulls the political ideas even further apart, which causes this sort of fragile system that we have now. Oh, thanks. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. um, if I could have 25 seconds to make two commercial announcements. Um, 
my next door neighbor up in Burlington is, uh, runs uh, this program that's actually coming to Thetford. They're collecting used bikes and sewing machines to send to, I don't know if it's Africa, uh, but places where they don't have. We had that come to the list here in Hartland. Okay, good. Good. Well, um, I'm, I'll leave a couple of flyers here. It's this weekend in Thetford. Yeah. Um, and the second, um, Lisa mentioned that I'm on the board of Vermont Humanities, mm -hmm. and I just want to put in a plug for, for their work. Um, go to the vermonthumanities.org website and just look at all the different programs that we've got. A lot of them are, are online. You can tune into talks and, and lots of great programs. Um, we had one of the, you had one here last week. The one that was um, here last Wednesday went up on the um, website this morning. And it was a very interesting woman who's a professor at uh, UVM who talked about the founder of the Box Project, which was a Vermont woman. Um, and they sent a lot, they did a lot with um, underprivileged and civil rights in Mississippi. So it was, it became a, a national organization. It's a fascinating mm -hmm. story. So yeah, so we do lots lots of programs like that. So um, check it out, and that's that's it. Thank you for being here. Thank you.